Hi everyone, I'm Sally Eves. Hi, I'm Adi. And we're delighted to be back together again to talk more around some of the latest trends that is affecting the world of work right now, particularly as we head into 2024. I'm right up there, there for us today. So I'm going to say that again. And right up there, there for us today is talking points. I think, Addy, I think governance, reflecting back on the changes there and also all things cybersecurity, particularly in the growing age of AI where we are right now. Addy, what's your first thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, there's so many things that's happening around the security and governments. Um, I think the best place to start is understanding where where are we using AI? Why are we, are we using AI for, right? Especially the whole world of generative AI and LLMs. Are we, is organization a consumer of LLMs? Are we consuming LLMs that are external to our organization? Are we uh, consuming LLMs, are employees consuming uh, LLMs that are internal to our, our organization and builds on top of our data? For example, if I have developers and they're writing code, I might want to build something in-house for them so they can code faster. But I don't want to rely on something external because that could expose me to different security threats, different privacy. Uh, some of my uh, developers might accidentally expose some of our IP private code outside, which we definitely don't want to do it. So many companies would lean into uh, building it in-house, kind of their own personal co-pilot for, uh, for coding in-house. So that's my uh, my second uh, rubric of how people are using LLMs. And of course, the third one is we are, as a company, exposing LLMs to our customers through chat, through multiple ways for us to work with. Um, um, and really, there's a big question here around privacy and around governance. And one of the most used use cases is actually the second one I mentioned is I want to make my developers more productive. I want to make them super happy. I want them to feel empowered. I want them to feel confidence. I want to really give them a platform where they would be able to thrive in, in building, building applications. Um, and SAP actually has a really interesting solution for that. Absolutely. I, I'm going to come on to that, if I may. I love that because I, I was exploring this, as I mentioned to you earlier, only the other day. And I think, firstly, I love how you set the scene there because you're absolutely right. And you mentioned it in a previous episode as well. Um, when we're looking at the introduction of generative AI, it does introduce risks that, that, that weren't comparable with machine learning, for example. And I love the fact you brought those to the fore, whether it's you know the need to embrace more transparency, to anticipate you know, new changes around compliance, but also that mix of LMs you brought to the fore. You know, whether it's open source uh, community, tech providers, internal, external, all of this is so, so key. So that need to kind of manage and monitor and, and govern all of this, it really is an imperative now, isn't it? And kind of tangible action on that, you know, underpinned by SAP Dual, we had the release of SAP Build Code, code very, very recently. And I saw some demonstrations of that at the Tech Ed event very recently too. And that is superb. And what you were saying there about, you know, the team and the collaboration between developers, it really is supporting that enhanced collaboration you know, between business folks and professional developers, for example. We know it really is improving that alignment, but also it has a lot of embedded support there around governance and also areas like life cycle management as well. So really bringing and integrating those needs together. So I think that's really, really exciting as one tangible way forward. Again, I saw a lot of people trying that as well. And again, you just get that feeling, don't you, when something's being experienced and it's really meeting a need. So what you were saying there, I think SAP Build Code is, is really aligning to that right now. Yeah, 100%. Like the no-code platform is brilliant. It enables people to uh, create applications faster, reach value faster, and also collaborate in a secure manner because SAP has this fantastic governance, right, that SAP was building for many, many years and fine tuning and making it, you know, great for all their customers. Uh, that really helps enhance everything that developers can do with no code, low code while collaborating securely uh, and leveraging things like jewels to become even better developers. So all the code they're producing, all the data they're relying on, everything is staying within their systems, which is critical, critical, especially if, you know, it's the business IP 
that's really important for us to keep it private and secure. Oh gosh, absolutely, absolutely. So that you know, security embedded by design, but also in terms of the development life cycle as well, that capacity to be creating those applications and those processes without losing the business context as well. It's it's incredibly powerful, isn't it? Bringing all that together. So, so, so true. And on that subject about cybersecurity, just, just back to, from an event on that very subject and kind of AI, as you can imagine, was kind of front and stage of pretty much everywhere in various different formats but really this kind of juxtaposition of AI is the great enabler and opportunity for for example these faster insights we've been talking about today you know the active intelligence being more proactive around security but obviously there's the bad actors too who are increasingly working together unfortunately as well and we're seeing obviously AI as a weaponization threat too so again I think we've talked about before about the skills piece here but that's trusted facilitation and support the partnership to work through these different challenges I think is absolutely key and how are you seeing that Kind of what are you hearing there with, with people reacting to this acceleration in AI and either confidence in or concerns around? Yes. So one of the greatest challenges with Gen AI is that Gen AI is um, an online learning, right? It's an active learning tool. Uh, and one of the challenges that it cannot unlearn what it learned. Uh, so, and learning means essentially establishing a relationship between different data points that it received. Um, and there's no way of, of going back to, you know, I cannot unlearn what I, what I just learned. So if I have a malicious attack that decides to somehow ingest, you know, fraudulent data or malicious data or, you know, accidentally incorrect data, or confidential data that's been injected into, into the system, we cannot go back. Once the model has been trained, it got a new version, that's it. Um, so it makes it really, really important for us to understand how to leverage that secure platforms that you know different companies are giving and SAP also giving. So to make sure that we are not accidentally introducing the wrong uh, data into the model. Um, and also on top of that, there are multiple uh, security threats uh, that comes from, from the space just beyond the fact that the model cannot unlearn all this, all this data that comes from the traditional uh, security like DDoS, if I'm exposing my application, right? It, I can easily uh, DDoS if I'm exposing a chatbot, for example, uh, and everyone wants to interact with that. It's just another tool, it's another API that is exposed there. Um, there are different uh, stages within the machine learning uh, area that could be uh that we can attack, like we can have a malicious actor in the adaptation phase, right? So I'm building, there is a model, we're leveraging it, but now we're adapting it to fit a specific need, like a no-code, low-code. And there could be a hacker that is going to somehow reach access to my system and change the whole adapt adaptation space. So it's really critical for us to have kind of a secure uh, place that we can trust and we can actually... Uh, uh, believe that this is, is a right uh, trusted system um, that is really, really critical. Um, and yeah, it's it's a growing space. There's also like some big conversations around can a user, in, if I'm exposing an LLM, if I'm exposing, if, if this is what I'm selling to my customer, kind of a chat bot or anything like that, is there a risk of them interacting with the system that I am exposing to expose data, to create some data leak? Are, they, are there any data leakage risk? And here, usually data leakage uh, has become a very hyped space, um, but there are some scenarios where my model wants to keep uh, uh, my solution. I want to keep uh, everything fresh. Uh, so I'm using different architecture that pulls data, fresh data from the system and combine it together with my prompt in order to, for the model to give me a more up-to-date, fresh answer. Uh, and here there is a risk because I am touching a database yet again. I am working directly uh, through my system with a database, there is a risk for uh, data leakage uh, that becomes kind of a, a great threat. So having solutions like uh, access control, privacy, authentication, authorization, uh, and having a secure space uh, is really, really critical. 
Oh, absolutely. And you mentioned there about data leakage and, and also, you know, on the other side of that, things around IP, we're also seeing like IP litigation, that we're going to see a massive acceleration of that, about IP loss, um, potentially through this area too. I think absolutely key areas there, and you brought, brought on to mind some other areas around compliance too, because again, you know, across the world, real acceleration around focus of compliance, quite understandably. And it goes back to some of those threat vectors you were talking about there, because they expand even further too, in terms of you know, threats we've never seen before that have been reimagined. I think, you know, if you look at all the different um, cybersecurity kind of research reports recently, everything comes back to kind of threat diversification probably is number one. And we've seen just different sophistications, whether it's bad actors coming together and you know, bringing back old threats from the 70s. We've seen some old, you know, telecoms protocols, for example, being re-engineered. They look, they look like they're latent, but actually can be brought back um, as a way, for example, to attack crypto wallets. So many different changes. And Emotet, I always call that the comedian, um, sorry, the chameleon even of cybersecurity threats because it's evolved so often. And it's not just the technology that's supporting that. And for example, the use of AI is actually the sophistication of the networks and the people are involved. You know, we've got the combination of, say, almost like organised crime groups in terms of cybersecurity. It's a cybercrime economy and the cost of entry has gone down so much. But equally, we've got such diversity because we've got these smaller groups coming together as well, you know, on dark marketplaces and forums. So to deal with all of that change, the compliance and governance is absolutely critical, um, but equally supporting organisations of all sizes through the complexity of this is really important too and you know, it struck me that the SEC rulings in the US obviously lots of lots of dialogue around that and where that's going to lead to and particularly around you know, board accountability for example in this area too um, and from a European Union perspective um, I'm doing a session very soon around this too um, and that's a new directive that's come in and I know there's there's it's really interesting because again although it's European Union massive global impact too because you know if you're a supplier that's serving an organization in scope and the scope's massively expanded you'll be in scope for this too. So although it's European Union, I'd say it's very international and you know, energy, transport, health, digital infrastructure, so many more um, entities that were within scope and the obligations, you know, whether it's about reporting or personal liability are much more stringent. So everything we're talking about here, how they're coming together, the imperative to deal with this now and kind of get ahead of this. And it comes back to, to the data, doesn't it? And how we're doing that management piece, the governance, et cetera, and getting that active intelligence together. So I went off on one there idea, but I'm really passionate about that because I can just see, you can see where something's going, you know, and, and again, getting involved in this right now, it's so, so key to make a difference. Yes, 100%. And having a secure system is key. Like you mentioned, the vectors are wide the, and the incentives are huge and the barrier of entry is low. So, you know, it kind of, people are jumping on that wagon and it's like, okay. We, we can do something about it. And having a system that is secure is really critical for the business. Absolutely. And I, it was a staggering statistic recently. I, I will, I've got my, my, my coffee here and something like if you buy five of those from, you know, from your, from your regular coffee shop, I'm, I'm sure there could be many choices of those, but say once a day, like Monday to Friday, you have five of those. That's the equivalent of like a ransom kit, like a base entry one that you can buy, you know, as an individual, let alone the more organized activities we've spoken about today. But it really just brings to the fore, you know, anyone one can launch something like this today to, to, to quite a high degree anyway so again for what we need to do to defend against this to come together and to look at it from a technology perspective but also the culture piece the right change management approach to be agile to change and obviously skills and information sharing like this as well we need that holistic focus really to, to, to make that difference don't we 100% community matters, and we definitely need to be active in that space to make sure we're supporting and amplifying each other uh, and learning from each other about different solutions and different attack vectors. So at least, you know, we're knowing what to plan and what to build for. I believe this is key for us to, to succeed in that space. Absolutely. Visibility really does make a difference. Addy, fantastic to chat with you again. And, and again, I know we mentioned it in the last episode, but I think we'll both be um, sharing some more examples of this alongside the series too, because I know that's something we both love to do. You know, talking about these subjects, backing it up with the, with the projects and demonstrations of this technology and human actors in, 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 in combination as well, and bringing that to the fore. So we'll definitely put some examples again where you can all get further information and get involved in this and be part of building this future collection too, because I think that's what it's all about. 100% from academic research that people are doing into practical usage, usage in the industry and practical use cases that we're seeing. There's a lot more to explore and I cannot 
you know, get more excited to come back again and chat all of the good things that are coming from our industry. Oh, fantastic stuff. Thanks so much. I've been Sally. Thank you. I've been Nadine.